I grew up uh, on the Tuscarora Reservation. Um, it's uh, near, you know, just north of Niagara Falls, New York. Yeah. Yeah. Do you like it? <laughs> yeah, I did, you know, but I also uh, always been fascinated with mountains, and it's it's pretty flat there. Mm -hmm. um, it's like a lake plain environment, you know, we have big rivers and lakes, the, the Niagara River and uh, Lake Ontario, Lake Erie, but um, it's all very flat, right? Water's pretty flat, <laughs> and uh, unless it's a mountain stream, then I guess, you know, that's what I kind of enjoy, so. Yeah. So what was it like growing up there? Um, uh, it's, I don't think anybody's asked me that. <laughs> um, let's see, it, it, it's, a, it's like a small town deal. I mean, if you're from a small town, everybody knows everyone. And, um, but it's also different in the fact that everybody's related to everyone um, in some way or form, whether genetically or through a clan um, or simply because we are one entire, you know, ethnic group of people that doesn't exist anywhere else in the world, you know, so the Tuscarora people exist only on that small reservation in western New York. Um, we've been there for a long time. Huh? Um, so it's unlike where a person that might be Irish from a small town outside of Syracuse, you know, they could go to Ireland, you know, and sort of find this is where everyone who is Tuscarora actually is. I mean, um, it doesn't mean all Tuscaroras live on the reservation because they, there's obviously people move away, but... So you grew up going to like 20 birthday parties a year, um, you know, 20 weddings a year, and unfortunately 20 funerals a year. Um, so it's a very tight-knit community. Um, and. Uh, it's, it's just un unlike anywhere else because all of your family is within reach, basically. Um, it's rare that somebody moves away from the res. Um, so, given all that, you know, that can be good and it can be bad, <laughs> depending on your perspective. If you're like me and kind of want to be alone in the woods sometimes, um, it's not as conducive. Um, but uh, you learn a lot from people about the, the, your history. You know, you really uh, end up, when you're a young adult, end up knowing who you are, actually, uh, and where you come from and what your history is. And ideally, you have identified this path that you follow. And that's kind of what the role of names are in our society, giving people names. Um, they, they follow this path. And, that kind of develops from all these experiences, you know, growing up. Yeah. But, you know, it was, uh, it was poor. I mean, we were, you know, everybody in the res was poor growing up. Nobody was rich. Nobody had estates and could bequeath a will to anyone. <laughs> um, and, and that's true um, on most reservations. Um, but I grew up also at a time where gas stations and cigarette shops um, started to proliferate and, and use loopholes in, in New York's tax law to uh, resell goods on the reservation. And so people became pretty wealthy quickly. Um, and it caused a lot of tension in the community. So just as there's a lot of celebrating in the community, the tension is also magnified because sometimes you're fighting your neighbor uh, mm -hmm. or your sister or your cousin. And there was a lot of dispute at the time over whether this was going to evolve into gaming, into developing an Indian casino. And uh, so for a while in high school, it was pretty rough. Um, the community was fighting. There was, I wouldn't say it was a civil war, but definitely a civil war of words. Um, not, there wasn't a whole lot of people that got hurt. Um, I shouldn't say that people did get hurt and assaulted and shot and things like that. It was pretty ugly. But uh, so then I came here and I, my parent, I found out about ESF in high school and I hated high school and I was like, can't wait to get out of here. Um, and they dumped me off down at Sadler Hall and, oh, and that was it. I went, got an undergraduate degree here. Oh. 
And uh, what's your role in the ESF community now? It's, um, well, I work for the Center for Native Peoples and the Environment. Um, it's it's uh, uh, organization here at ESF, um, headed by Dr. Robin Kimmer, and she, um, we, we have a number of different roles we play, both uh, to try to attract young Native students, Indigenous people here, for, to get advanced degrees in science and environmental studies. Um, but also a, a big role in outreach, going to Indian reservations uh, and communities, and you know, kind of responding to their issues and concerns. Um, so right now, I'm <clears throat> going down to the Onondaga Nation School every Monday to teach kids uh, the eight native frog and toad calls of this area, um, <laughs> which turns them hopefully into little citizen monitors um, to see what they're hearing in the woods. Um, so that type, those type of projects we do. Before that, you were talking about clans in the Tuscarora Nation. What clan were you from? I'm, I'm bear. Um, cool. And there's two families at Tuscarora, white and black bears. Um, but there are nine clans overall that were part of the so the Tuscarora, I don't know if you know, are part of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. Um, and within the Confederacy, there's nine. There's three for the air, which is the hawk, the heron, and the snipe. And then three for the land, uh, the turtle, the wolf, and the bear. And then three for the water is the beaver, the eel, and, sorry, the turtle for the water, um, the wolf, the deer, and the bear for the land. Those are the broad clan groups across the Confederacy. And so like when I go to Onondaga, I'm related to the bears there. And that's kind of how peace was installed between nations that we became relatives with each other. So what is your connection to Onondaga Lake? Well, uh, it, you know, it's, um, it, it's uh, multiple types of connections. Um, po politically, uh, it is our capital of our Confederacy. Um, so for Tuscarora, that's really critical because we were in North Carolina, um, probably um, communicating back and forth with the events that took place here on Onondaga Lake, but uh, when Daganawida and um, the Peacemaker formed, um, I mean, gosh. So it's, you know, Hiawenta and, and the Peacemaker. Um, they formed the Confederacy there right on the lake. They said these roots of peace extend everywhere. So we took that literally and came north when it was, when it was getting nasty down in North Carolina um, with the settlers. Basically, we got pushed out during the Tuscarora Wars, um, 1711 to 1713. It's actually one of the first large-scale displacements of an entire nation from their Aboriginal territory in the United States. Um, but, you know, 100 years before the Trail of Tears from Cherokee, we actually moved our whole nation up to upstate New York um, and sought those roots of peace that were planted on the lake. And were able to then become not absorbed, but adopted into the Confederacy as the Sixth Nation. So um, we, so it's really significant because it's kind of like this beacon, this political and social and cultural beacon that calls people to the safety and the concepts of the great law that were created there. Um, you know, the three concepts are peace, power, and righteousness, and, uh, or a good mind is the, kind of what they say. And then more physically, I like to canoe and fish in the lake. <laughs> I mean, I, it's a beautiful lake. It's, it's an amazing body of water that needs to be restored. Um, we, um, when I was getting my master's here a few years ago, pursuing my master's here a few years ago, um, we took some kids from the reservation and floated down Onondaga Creek all the way to Onondaga Lake. Um, and uh, it was really, really good, you know, to restore our relationship with, in that way, 
um, at that time. Um, so it also spawned more interest from some other people and two years ago we uh, put some canoes in down there on the creek and then paddled to New York City. Um, so we yeah, went the Wampum, for right? the Turo Wampum, yeah. So I took some interns through the help of the center here on that journey. Um, and it was great to see where Onondaga Lake fits in the watershed. Um, and its relationship with other water bodies, the Seneca River, and the Oneida River, and um, Oswego River. It's really all part of the Oswego River system itself, um, which is an amazing system um, unto itself that's connected to the Finger Lakes as well. So. And um, how has the pollution in Onondaga Lake affected your life? Um, well, I didn't grow up here, or I didn't, you know, even when I moved here, I was eating on a SU meal plan at Sadler, so I, you know, I, I wasn't so dependent on it like I would have been. Um, but, um, but I know my, you know, brothers at Onondaga, we call them our older brothers, um, are, uh, are heavily impacted by it. I mean, you know, it would have been, in fact, we were just talking about that in the language. The, the, the idea of fish and fishing in the Onondaga language has, has, has um, evolved over time to, to more of a, an enjoyment, more of a hobby, or more of, a, uh, more of an exception rather than a rule. Um, of the mercury and then the, you know just in general the the loss of species you know so the real species that were there were these you know Atlantic salmon brook trout sturgeon and eel um, and right now the eels essentially becoming in danger in the system Atlantic salmon don't exist um, sturgeon are barely there uh, and brook trout are, are completely gone and so now we have a whole community of Pacific imports, um, Pacific salmon, um, and a little bit more of a mix of warm water species. But um, so anyway, you know, I, I'm gonna uh, always steer us back towards fish in these conversations because <laughs> I, I mean that's part of the the idea. Of course, there were obviously lots of medicine plants, you know, that were um, growing in these weirdly saline environments, um, it's a unique attribute of the lake um, where we would have gathered water and then evaporated for salt. Um, so salt then is a big part of our diet because we don't have frigates, you know, so we had to cure and brine and dry everything with salt. So it's critical for preserving meat. Um, so it's, again, it's all uh, this, this system you know, that it connects fish with plants, with people, with sustenance, with food, um, and energy even. So when you pollute, pollute that, obviously, you, you have drastic changes in the language, like, you know, the loss of fishing terminology. You know, people don't know how to make nets anymore out of dog bane, go throw them in the lake and catch and harvest fish. So they're not using that language. They're not even saying fish net not passing that on to their future generations. So the language, <coughs> words actually just die. That's um, really interesting. It's like 1984. Yeah, like Orwellian sort of. Yeah. It, it is, except for it's, yeah. I mean, it's tied in with the environment um, so deeply, you know. That, so you, just one little thing, it's like this, you know, ripple effect. And um, so, yeah, directly me, I mean, I would love to go down there and like camp out and fish and hunt for a few days. Um, and, and that's kind of my personal interest is in restoring those uses to those places and, and, and building a relationship with them. Are you involved or were you involved in any efforts to restore the lake? Um, yeah, not, not directly. Um, I, when I first left ESF, I worked for a non-for-profit group called Atlantic States Legal Foundation. And they were one of the primary uh, instigators of forcing the county to uh, 
clean up their crack that they were dumping in through the through their municipal sewage Literally. discharge. Yeah. So they sued them under the Clean Water Act and won in court. And a lot of the changes to that plant um, uh, are coming have have come about now because of that. So I was just, in, you know, a lot of that was in motion already as I graduated school, so it was already going. Um, I definitely work with the Onondagas when they need help or ask me to in commenting on some of the restoration aspects that are going on now. I'm very familiar with um, the way companies do these cleanups because there's so many going on back home at Tuscarora in western New York. Um, you know, this is a dump in a pretty concentrated location, although very big on the lake. But in Western New York, we just have, like, the whole place is a dump. I mean, the whole county of Niagara has broad, you know, All the toxic waste. long history of contamination, um, toxic and radiological, um, because of the involvement with the Manhattan Project um, back in the 50s. So. So what can the average person do to help us? I mean, I think the idea of a ecological or carbon footprint is important. Um, I think because that's the only personal, that's, that's like a direct personal decision that people can make um, on a daily basis to reduce their, their footprint. Um, whatever way or form they can, transportation, food, energy. Um, I mean, that's always, and that's kind of what we were taught, you know, is like, it's not our right to do these things, it's our responsibility. So we have this responsibility to reduce our footprint. Um, personal responsibility, that's like the only real thing an individual can do. Uh, immediate, that has immediate consequences, actually. And then beyond that, whether people are interested in, you know, taking that step further and, and getting the collective consciousness going about our footprints um, and its impact, uh, and then promoting, you know, the protection and restoration of, of these places. Uh, that's, I mean, that's the best we can do at this point. And some people are, even in the circles I run with, are also thinking about, you know, preparation uh, for when these systems collapse uh, and what we need to do as far as saving seeds. Um, that's a big part of my work is to save our, our traditional seeds that aren't commercially or publicly available and keep growing those out so that we can replant. And the skills that are needed to do that, you know, um, to, to be able to reduce our footprint uh, and fit within the landscape we, we live in. So, I mean, yeah, I guess that's what, I don't know. <laughs> that's that's okay. a pretty heavy question. I'm oh, sorry. No, it's good though. It's, people need to think about that. I didn't know that you, were that you guys were preparing for an ecosystem's collapse. Yeah. Like, that's very heavy. Well, yeah, I mean, we see it, right? I mean, you see these climate change impacts now that are changing systems, uh, releasing methane and deep permafrost tundra way up in places that have never been exposed to the air or the environment in like thousands of years. You know, that's in a way, a, a, whether it's a collapse or, or a, a dynamic change, it, it's a change that's coming. So yeah, it's, um, but we've always been doing that in a way, like our instructions say to know that this collapse is coming, but it's up to you to prevent it. That's kind of our instructions. It's not like, well, we'll just give up and let it collapse. It's like, no, it's up to us to prevent that collapse um, and that destruction. So, so we always say seeds, you know, and we always um, try to use our language, um, always try to do our ceremonies, and you know, that's part of that cycle. So what is your personal vision for Onondaga Lake in the future? Uh, well, we want to be able to, you know, eat the fish and drink the water. That's, I mean, that's the 
the only vision we've ever had I think you know <laughs> In, in order to do that, again, it's a system of, of plants and geology and soils and, and rainfall and climate. You know, I mean, it's 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 an intricate system. Um, so we need to restore the, those forms that, that were there and that are there. We respect the forms of nature that are there, but ensure that they're functioning. You know, that there's some real function to their not to. Um, that their responsibilities are being are being met, that they can fulfill their responsibility as a plant, as a fish, as a as a you know as a as an escarpment or as a forest, um, as a lake, and has it has this responsibility that we say it was given to them, um, and it's just a matter of making sure that they can fulfill that, you know, so. We have bald eagles right now, which I look at like every day on the way to work, sitting on the lake. Uh, it's really cool because that's a major symbol of uh, our um, of our people. You know, it's like a watchdog it sits at the top of the tree and watches for danger. And it's really cool to see them every day. They're these big poplar trees on the on the south side of the lake, and it's two, three, four, five big bald and golden eagles sitting up there. And actually overlooking the restoration too, which is kind of weird, right? Like overlooking Honeywell and their job trailers and construction equipment. And so it's really neat to see that. But, uh, but we want to make sure those eagles aren't eating these contaminated fish and, and somehow, you know, their, their young or offspring, there, there's a reduction in the fitness. And, or something that maybe changes in chromosomes or something that we're not even aware of yet from eating these fish. Um, we need to make sure that that's, that functionality is restored fully um, so it can fulfill its duties. It was given a duty um, and it's trying to fulfill it every day, you know, so. That's my vision is that, you know, the, the, both the form and the function are restored. Oh, uh, sure, yeah. I mean, uh, my opinion is largely biased towards what the Anadagas think and how they're reacting towards it um, because I haven't read through and, under, and, and don't understand enough of the chemistry and, and, the, and, the, and the monology involved. Um, but what I do understand is that anytime you pollute someplace, and this is like a general thing I think about, is that it takes it takes 10% of your effort to clean up 90% of the contamination that's there. But it's gonna take 90, the other 90% of your effort to clean up that last little bit of 10% that's left. Because it's so difficult um, once it happens, once you spill something, it's stained, it's, it's, it, the stain goes deep and um, it takes so much work to I guess now I think about it, it's like when you, you're eating and you slop something on your shirt, right? It's so easy to get most of it off, but it, the stain that's left, you'll never, maybe never get it out. Um, and uh, so I realized the constraints that they are under and the near impossibility to clean up the lake 100%. That doesn't make them any less responsible though because they should be doing more than the minimum. But as a for-profit company, their interest is in doing the minimum to, to, to reduce cost um, and to protect the bottom line of their shareholders. And that's a huge company. That's a massive worldwide international company. Um, whether they have the resources to employ and engage those last, try to get after that last 10%, they're going to tell you, no, we don't. We can't afford to, to, to for the next 50 years, continue to dredge or to continue to monitor. And for the next 100 years, you know, they'll say, no, we, we only have this much. So you don't actually know. You know, you just know that they probably do the minimum. They, they probably err on the 
the side of the middle and, and we we are a people of maximum, you know, because they there's this responsibility. It's not it's like if you do it part way, it's really not done, right? I mean if you just clean up something a little bit, so in the same way with our responsibility, if you just go out and shoot something and you don't actually use it, you know, that's not really fulfilling your responsibility. Um, so whether Honeywell has a vested interest in 100 years in the lake, mm, no one really knows that, you know. Um, they probably don't, that's my guess. That's a very philosophical answer to dredging, but <laughs> I mean, it's, it's I just know you, you, you can dredge all you want, but you're not going to get everything. That's the problem. Um, and there's going to be constraints put on you to say, leave it in place, don't bother it, let it be. Um, and there's some science behind that, too. I mean, whether you're disrupting contaminants and re-entering them into the food chain, or maybe they'd be completely immobile, um, I don't know enough about the lake to, to answer that, but so, yeah, that's dredging. Yeah, I see it every day on the, on the way to work. It's pretty cool. Well, it's over now, I think, right? Yeah. yeah. March. March. 